Welcome to the Journey of an Esthete podcast, a comprehensive examination of all things aesthetic, the arts, the humanities, and what it means to be human. This is Mitch Hampton from Journey of an Esthete. Wonderful. I am so excited uh, to have you on this on this podcast. I can't begin so to tell I. you. Um, I'm going to give a little, in your case it's impossible to do, but I'm going to try to do a brief introduction. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can't say anything about that. <laughs> okay, I, I, will, I will say something now. I, I feel uh, very much... Uh, when I was thinking about you as a guest being um, a representative of the spirit of our podcast, and I was thinking, oh, how lovely. I was thinking about this uh, phrase. Um, it's a phrase that's not used much anymore. A uh, public intellectual. So, yeah. so what I would, yeah. what I would say about you is that you are actually the equivalent now of a, of a Lionel Trilling. Oh my God! Or no. <laughs> you know, ser seriously, Lionel Trilling or Isaiah Berlin, uh, or or Sontag or the late Harold Bloom, you are in that Parthenon Parthenon of real, genuine public intellectuals, as opposed as opposed as opposed to um, these newfangled you know phrases like thought leaders and influencers and all those awful those awful things that people have come up instead. So you, in, in terms of teaching the value of the arts and letters and the humanities and presenting it to a wider public. Um, and so your book, uh, Reading Lolita in Tehran, was a big hit. And was, it was very important in um, the, book, the book club movement and the explosion of book club movement uh, in the early 2000s. And, and so you're a part of that. And you are a scholar of uh, Henry James and Vladimir Nabokov, and you have written... You're Iranian American, and you uh, have actually studied at the University of Oklahoma, I believe, as well as Oxford University, and you've taught English, and there's just so many things. I, I, I'll, I'll quit while that's all I could come up with off the top of my head. So welcome to, the, to this show. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be having this conversation with you, especially during these times. Absolutely. So I usually on this show do something of a linear chronology which is part, uh -huh. partly informational and partly biographical. And I saw under the, under the um, assumption that out of that nonlinear things can start to happen and things will start uh -huh. to come into people's consciousnesses. And uh, do you, would you like to proceed in that way in terms of talks of origins or early biography? You just want to jump into... No, but you know. I, I'm fine with whatever way you choose to go. Okay. So you might want to talk about how uh, uh, then how you became so learned uh, uh, and erudite in arts and letters and literature and, and, and that story and, and another country and coming here and all the rest of it, if you don't mind. Well, my love affair with literature started when I was very young. I was, must have been about three and a half, four, and every night my father would tell me a story. And uh, he was very democratic in his storytelling. Uh, he would not limit it to uh, nationality or language or ethnicity or anything like that. So one night um, we would travel to the land of 1001 Nights or oh, wow. our epic poet uh, uh, Ferdowsi. And the next night we'll go to um, France uh, with the little prince or uh, mm -hmm. to England with... Alice in Wonderland or um, to Denmark with um, uh, Little Match Girl. Wow. <laughs> I mean, just names uh, keep coming to me from yeah. all over the world. And uh, uh, I remember that the first book uh, I listened to and read, I was very young, I was about six or seven, uh, from America was um, uh, Wizard of Oz. Oh, so, bomb, yeah. 
at wow. that young age, and I think that was really a determining factor in the way uh, my relationship with books went and mm-hmm. with stories. Uh, I realized that I can live um, in my small room in Tehran and the whole world will come to me. Huh. And uh, that is how it has been since then, that no matter what rooms I have lived in and which part of the world, uh, I always felt that um, I had the world with me, you know, uh, wherever I went. Um, And I called it um, uh, stealing from uh, a word from Nabokov. I called it my portable world, uh, where no one can take away from me. What what uh, what essay does that appear in, and what is that from? Do you, do you uh, that uh, the, the the portable world um, from Penin. Oh, Penin. Okay, it's from the novel. Yeah, um, Penin uh, uses a soccer a, a ball, a football. Mm-hmm. He keeps asking the guy at the shop for a football, and the way he, and Nabokov says that he's, he kept with his hands drawing a por- his portable world. I hope it's not too far off topic because I don't want to go into a rabbit hole on Nabokov. But it, what do you? What's your impression of Christopher Plummer's um, interpretation of the lectures in in in, lit- in literature? Have you seen a version of him playing uh, playing Nabokov? I don't remember. Yeah, Christopher Plummer did the actual lectures. Played played uh, Nabokov. Um, it just to check it out. I think it's available. He, he yeah. did the actual lectures. Well, he, he's he's playing Nabokov. The, you know the English, uh, the famous essays in. in uh, yeah, um, English. Yeah, the essays yeah. in R- Russian and uh, English European literature. literature. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what do I think of Russian literature? I mean, his lectures on Russian literature. No, I'm mean, I just saying if you had seen the Christopher Plum- Plummer uh, dr- dramatization of those lectures. I, it's okay, no. just off off the topic, but that just comes comes to mind. But um, uh, so Penin, uh, and so you're you're start so already because you're you're very young to be yeah. you're very young and you're and you're actually in your consciousness is getting, I guess, uh, enriched or enlightened by all these uh, these figures from around the world through through written language, right? Yeah, yeah, and then later on, I was very young when my parents sent me away to continue my studies in England, and I was only 13, and, uh, uh, you know, at any age, leaving a place you call home and all the beloved people um, that live there behind is painful, but especially at that age. And um, again, these were not all very conscious acts, but I took with me um, three books of poetry. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two of them were by our uh, great uh, classical poets, Hafez and uh, Rumi, Mm -hmm. and one by a very popular contemporary feminist um, poet, uh, Furuk Farrokhzad. And uh, I mentioned in reading Lolita how uh, at night, you know, it was very cold and uh, um, there was a very small um, electric uh, heater in the room. And uh, yeah, uh, if you sat close to the heater, you would freeze, you would burn. And if you sat too far, you hmm. would freeze. So I would go under the covers and read these books. Uh, and uh, I learned that that is how you carry your home with you. Uh-huh. Uh, that reality is so fragile. Uh, one moment you are in a country named Iran, in a town named city named Tehran, and the next moment you are uprooted uh, and transferred into a city called Lancaster in England. Uh, wow. That has nothing to do with your Tehran. So what do you have from Tehran? Uh-huh. What can you take with yourself from Tehran? It was memories and what I call the guardians of memory, uh, which were books. Uh, mm-hmm. I realized that I can have my Iran with me, uh, wow. if not physically, um, in a deeper sense. Uh, and uh, I got uh, to know and love first uh, England and then America uh, through their books, 
through reading Austin and Auden and Fielding and Smollett and uh, Stern and uh, uh, and then later in America, the same process mm-hmm. happened where I was made to feel at home before I actually visited and acclimatized to that home uh, yeah. through that literature, through mainly its fiction and poetry. So you're, you're saying there's a geographical two-way street in that when you were, had only lived in Iran as a child, you were already anticipating a little bit from England. You already, yeah. you already knew about uh, Jane Austen and English authors before you actually physically got to England. And then once you're in England, you have your memory of your native Iran through their art, their literature. In their poet, so it goes in both directions, right? It, 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 it yeah, that point. is that was the whole point. That both my worlds, what they had in common, uh, was the literature. Mm-hmm. That was what uh, linked me uh, mm-hmm. to both uh, my geographical uh, locations, uh, and uh, um, that is why it is very difficult for me to um, not see literature as um, uh, within a universal context. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that the, one of the most amazing and crucial things about imagination and ideas is that they transcend all the bond boundaries mm-hmm. that reality imposes on us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and once a work of imagination or idea is created, it doesn't belong to just the locality from which it comes. Mm -hmm. It belongs to the whole world. Mm -hmm. Actually, I believe now, after having lived in the Islamic Republic for so long, um, that it belongs to people who appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Um, If someone uh, in America does not, if people in America do not appreciate, um, uh, I don't know, Fitzgerald or Baldwin, and uh, some young girl who has never left the Islamic Republic uh, loves them and reads them and talks about them, then Baldwin and Fitzgerald belong to her, mm-hmm. and yeah. vice versa, uh, and vice versa. That's fantastic. I mean, I want to mention this really wonderful book. It's a few years old, uh, The Republic of Imagination. And that, yeah. book, that book is very important to me because it's in part about this very... It's about many things, but one of the themes, of course, is this issue of universality. And um, uh, one of the things I love about your writing is you'll, you, will, you develop this, this, your own form in which you'll talk about a, a fictional uh, work or author, like, say, Carson McCullers, for example. Yeah. And you'll, in, you'll weave that into a personal, non-fictional account of, of a student or a colleague or, or something in your life. And this question about geography and universality makes me think of Joanna, right? And your, your, your yeah. discussions of what's Southern or, or not and Carson McCullers, or, or, you know, uh, that just comes to mind when you, men- when you mention that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Carson McCullers in uh, Heart is a Lonely Hunter uh, draws such amazing picture of uh, uh, people who are so different from her. I mean, mm. um, uh, for example, her insights into um, racism and um, uh, the the life that her uh, that is imposed on her African American characters uh, is so relevant today. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that that is the whole point about literature: that you constantly have to go under the skin of other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, this word other has been abused so much. Mm -hmm. Um, But I use it in terms of um, imagination in the sense that imagination is uh, based on curiosity. It is based on you wanting to come out of yourself and go into something new. Even when you're thinking about yourself, you're thinking about the stranger within you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the whole idea behind imagination is curiosity about those who are not you. And through that curiosity, then you attain a much misused word, namely empathy. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 you connect to those who are not you mm-hmm. and that is why uh, i i keep going back to this universal context of literature um that uh, it is impossible uh, to read a great book and not to feel that sense of curiosity and empathy in it that's absolutely true and i i'm, I'm glad to hear you speak in your own words about that that issue it might be the most important thing now in 2020, in, in, in June now, I don't yeah. know, but, but uh, uh, I'm really curious, this is maybe a, a too practical or technical question, how did you arrive at your, your, um, your style in writing, this, this uh, method of weaving, weaving the, the actual criticism of the book, or English criticism, if that's what it is, with the personal <laughs> accounts of your life, is so be- beautiful, one of a kind, I don't know anybody else who does that. Did you, did you, were you starting to develop that when you got to England, or when did this happen, occur or start to happen? It, it, it came out of a need, actually, like most writing does. Um, when, um, when I was in, living in the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, I became very curious about this whole relationship between fiction and reality, mm-hmm. uh, about how fiction, reading works of great works of fiction, changes our perception of reality and how our realities, the moments we're living, uh, influences the way we read these books. And, um, and uh, the first book I wrote was on Nabokov in Iran, and I wanted to talk about this in the style that I later developed uh, in reading Lolita in Tehran. Mm-hmm. Um, but I realized that living in the Islamic Republic, it wasn't just the political things that were censored, but also um, uh, personal things. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't talk about the first book I read by Nabokov was given to me by my boyfriend, Ted, who wrote in wow. the flyleaf to Azar, my Ada, uh, Ted. Uh, mm-hmm. I couldn't write that. Wow. And so in my diary, I started uh, under the heading of things I have been silent about, which later became the title for my memoir. I started writing about strange things in Iran, the absurdity of living in Iran, mm-hmm. like re- like going to, to uh, um, gypsy thing concerts in Iran mm. uh, or um, uh, reading Dolita in Iran mm. uh, and, uh, and you know that sort of um, style came out of my urge to link to find the links between my reality and mm. my fiction uh, or as James Baldwin so beautifully puts it he talks about uh, linking uh, um, the possibilities suggested by books mm-hmm. to the impossibilities of life. You know, it's a, it's, uh, it, it's almost like a necessity and freedom. The kind yeah. of the, the tension between the, uh, the if a potential conflict between necessity and, and freedom. You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm thinking now about one of my favorite filmmakers, uh, Kiarostami. I was curious, oh, yes, yes. and I'm thinking now because he died very recently, uh, just in the pa- past few years. Yeah. And, I, and I'm thinking about an argument I had with somebody. I I think it was about um, I think when Ten came out, this mm. extraordinary film Ten about the women in the the car. Yeah. Or, or maybe Taste of Cherry. Now I remember somebody telling me that I could not really fully appreciate these movies simply Why? because I simply because I had never set foot in Iran, and there's all these inside. Oh. Things and I thought this was the most ridiculous thing because I was moved to tears by Taste of Cherry. Taste of Cherry knocked me out, even though yeah. I have little in common with the with the man in that in that film, um, you know, uh, uh, on the surface, you know. And I and if I, if I I realized that that my friend was my friend was mistaken, and I think I think you're right that there's this universality. Um, yeah, I mean, Kiarostami uh, became. Well, well known to the degree that he did become well known in Iran, um, because partly because of the eye of the world redefining him. I mean, we need as writers, uh, we're constantly writing for strangers. Mm-hmm. We don't pick our 
our readers, they pick us. <laughs> yeah, and, that's true. You know, and they come from all over the world. Mm -hmm. They come from places, I mean, I'm always amazed, like I get, um, I got an email once from a captain um, in American Army, mm -hmm. uh, talking about how she wanted to um, connect to uh, the Iraqi people uh, and, and asking advice about it after having read Reading Lolita. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I read, wrote Republic of Imagination, and as you know, that book is about um, America and how I became an American, um, I was so pleased to see uh, like it was um, a hit uh, in um, Kuwait and Bahrain. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they wanted to know about uh, uh, Mark Twain and Carson McCullers and Sinclair Lewis and James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is the whole uh, miracle uh, of of literature. It's amazing. I mean, you're you're 13 in England, and then you somehow in college, college, I guess end up in Oklahoma, right, in the 70s, yeah. early 70s. Talk about that. That's, that's just such a remarkable, <laughs> remarkable journey. I mean, I, I, I and what's happening, yeah. I was going to go to the University of California in Santa Barbara. Wow. Uh, I had heard about this English department, but I yeah. got married at a very young age. I okay. was in my teens, late wow. teens, and for all the wrong reasons, oh. uh, which uh, I won't go into here, but right. um, uh, my husband was already getting his master's degree uh, in um, electrical engineering, and mm. at that time, the engineering school was flooded with Persians, mm. uh, and I was the only a foreigner in the English department at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, it was quite an amazing experience, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I reaffirmed and confirmed my love of literature mm -hmm. through being in that English department. Yeah. Uh, I fell in love with 18th century um, in British literature, mm -hmm. um, uh, th uh, through uh, having studied in Oklahoma. And yeah. uh, so uh, I don't regret it. I mean, I always yeah. imagine what it would have been like had I gone to Santa Barbara. Yeah. But um, I don't regret. Uh, I saw a part of American life that I would not have normally seen. Uh, and uh, Norman was a sea of liberalism. Uh, at the heart of a very conservative state. Mm. And uh, for me, noting those contradictions um, mm. uh, were very interesting and uh, intriguing. <laughs> everybody needs an anchor in life. You, me, just everybody. Anchor made this whole show possible. I'm immensely grateful to them. You too can use Anchor to make your own shows and create your own vision. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Thank you. I bet they were interesting, but of course you were actually, you were both an, leading this, an aesthetic life. But you also in part an activist, if I understand from your writing, in other words, against yeah. Vietnam and... And so there's all this going on, uh, and I remember the, the figure you write about Mike a lot, uh, the activist Mike, and then I remember in your own memoir. Yeah. Yes, you, that was in Republic of Imagination. Right, right. Yeah, and I and I thought it's just so interesting that you're in Oklahoma, you're in Oklahoma, uh, be, being an activist, and you know it just made me think a lot about <laughs> think a lot about um, this 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 eternal. Um, I guess it's a dilemma for for the aesthetic person or someone that loves the arts. This dilemma, you know, of of, of censor, censorship or, um, you know, maybe secular totalitarianism, which wants to, uh, which is you know, all, as you know, is always more interested in, in in what kind of government a country has than anything else, or you know, you know, those kind of questions, you know, than than. Um, uh, yeah, you know. I'm, 
And I learned from activism uh, that uh, being involved in a movement can enrich you, but I, it can also empty you. Uh, you have to be very careful because uh, for me there was this contradiction between um, uh, the very open world of literature, which I never gave up at the right. height of my ex activism, right. and uh, the rather closed wo world of um, my, my activism, that kind of activism, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, became ideologically bound. And I never felt completely at home. At the, I, I never felt at home there, right. actually. I always had clashes. Uh, what were the, what, what were the, if you don't mind yeah. my asking, what was, the, was there a, a theme that, was there a general overarching theme of those clashes? Was it about these questions of the freedom of speech or... or how to interpret a novel or, or, or what would yeah, it? yeah and, and, and personal freedom, the uh, way you lived, the way you wanted to live. Uh -huh. uh, for example, uh, uh, at the height of its Puritanism, which was near the end, before, just before the Islamic Revolution, um, they started talking about... Um, and the, the, uh, uh, who, whom you see, whom you don't see, um, they would call uh, the group within the larger group that I associated with bourgeois, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. because um, we continued our studies. Uh, it, and uh, so it was a very uh, strict um, uh, ideology mm -hmm. that constantly limited your freedom of expression and freedom of association, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I would uh, always, in the middle of um, meetings, I would uh, 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 pretend that I had a headache and I would <laughs> leave for a while <laughs> and then come back. Wow. I learned a great lesson mm -hmm. from that. Uh, I learned that... Um, it is not enough for us to um, go after idealistic goals, to talk about freedom. That freedom is an attitude. You have to change your attitude. You have mm -hmm. to change your perception. It goes beyond political slogans or even policy changes. Uh, right now, I look at what is happening in our country, and in one sense, I'm very hopeful. Mm -hmm. And on another sense, um, you see that the opposition to that hope uh, is where it tries to um, uh, come in and impose a certain way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, I, I keep hoping that, uh, uh, well, you always live with hope, and I always say that uh, hope for me uh, is not uh, the same as optimism, uh, right. as uh, I believe what Václav Havel used to say. He used to say that uh, hope, hope is not optimism. Hope is doing something because it makes sense hmm. and it has meaning. Oh, wow. That's an important yeah, distinction. I, I really love Havel. I like, his play, I like his plays, too. People tend to forget, yeah. forget Havel, the playwright. They tend to remember... More the uh, the responsibility of the uh, the famous essay of the, the um, uh, about dissidents. Um, did you ever meet Havel? Did you? Uh, yes, actually, I met him here when he came uh, for a function um, at the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, I I love him. I love his re his works have been translated. Uh, into uh, Persian, uh, this or organization that is a human rights organization mm -hmm. has pub uh, the Borumand Foundation. They yeah. have been publishing uh, amazing translations of um, people like Havel, Hannah Arendt, uh, oh, wow. and uh, uh, they are very popular in Iran. That's good. Uh, 
I'm glad when that people are reading. When I was in reading. Iran, Hannah Arendt and Karl Popper were uh, oh wow, uh, so people like blockbusters. <laughs> <you> <laughs> so people in Tehran were reading the Open Society and its enemies. And, and, yes, yeah, yes, wow. that is what I mean. That um, ideas and imagination have yeah. no borders. That's right. Uh, in the same way That's that right. um, you know, in terms of activism. Uh, people come into the streets in the U.S. and then they come into the streets in the U.K. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, we share, we are, mem- I mean, that is what empathy is all about. Uh, it is about the fact, not just our differences, although we celebrate difference, but mm-hmm. the shock of recognition of how much we have in common both in the best and the worst sense of the word. Mm. Uh, You know, in Republic of Imagination, I was trying to warn uh, the American people that totalitarianism doesn't only happen in other places. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people would look at me and they say, oh, poor Iranians, you know, as if America was immune. Right. And I always told them that we were like your distorted mirror uh, mm. that uh, shows the best and the worst that America has. And you can't be so complacent. Mm-hmm. You know, you have freedom is like happiness. It needs to be pursued. You never completely have it. Mm. And so you have to guard it. And that is what worried me in that book about America, Mm -hmm. uh, that we forgot the accountability and responsibility that came with freedom. And uh, while we were forgetting to read people like Arendt and Popper uh, in America, uh, people in Iran were remembering uh, to read them. They found Arendt and Popper relevant to to their lives under a totalitarian system and now look at where we are mm. with Trump. Well, in a way, yes, absolutely. In a way, the Republic of Imagination is a, is a book for 2020 or 2019. It's actually a, a four years ahead, ahead, you know, ahead for four or five years ahead of its, of its time. You know, in a way, it's, yeah, it's, I, it's I remember I had a quote in that. Uh, there were two quotes in the, that book that I remember mm. because I really liked them. One was by Ray Bradbury, who was mm. saying that um, you don't have to burn books to destroy a culture. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is to stop people from reading books, yeah. uh, which shows that indifference we showed, that mm. denigration of ideas and imagination. And there was one by Joseph Brodsky mm. uh, saying that um, Stalin, uh, Lenin, and Mao uh, we're all literate. Mao even mm-hmm. wrote some verse, and Stalin yeah. was an editor. But what was wrong with them was that their uh, hit list was longer than their reading list. <laughs> That's funny. That's kind of yeah, a, that, a, a kind of a gallows humor there, a little bit. Yeah, from yeah. and uh, and that is the the whole point. Um, that uh, I, I when I was writing that book, I was. I wrote it with so much anxiety hmm. because I thought, oh, my God, you know, I left Iran and came here and now there's nowhere else to go, hmm. you know. And, yeah. uh, of course, then Trump came and uh, we saw how easily some people bow hmm. to totalitarian tendencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm hoping that this country having democratic institutions and there are people who are yeah. not bowing, but yeah. um, uh, we don't know the outcome. Yeah, we don't. I want to backtrack a little bit because you were, you were at Oxford in England, and I, I've mentioned on this podcast before my admiration for Isaiah Berlin. Did you, did you cross yeah. paths with Berlin or meet him or see him speak? Because he, uh, I saw, I met Michael Ignatius. There. Oh, of course, um, yes. Uh, and uh, I love Isaiah Berlin. I think he is, um, the, you know, he, in some ways, um, Isaiah Berlin and George Orwell um, show the amazing uh, clarity and at the same time depth of the best British um, uh, writing on imagination and ideas. Mm -hmm. 
I um, that that way of writing is so rare. It is rare, isn't it? What What do you think? Do you think it's um, fallen? Uh, well, it's it, and that way of writing, I guess maybe it, it's it's um, because it's very um, it communicates with a wide audience, right? It communicates with a wide and, audience, yeah. and uh, it is very democratic. Very democratic, in its and yet approach. at the same time, it's very rigorous. It's really, it's like a very, um, it's really something. It's yeah, hard to it do is both. very rigorous. It's hard to it do is, both. That, that is the whole point, that um, it doesn't compromise. It yeah. doesn't tone down or uh, come down because it is writing to a mass audience. It doesn't insult the reader's intelligence. Uh, it stays at a very high level mm-hmm. of uh, rigorousness. And at the same time, um, it can reach so many people. And it can reach them not just through their mind, but through their heart. Mm-hmm. You know, and... Um, I I really uh, miss reading more of that kind of writing. Uh, you know, the kind of writing that is uh, dictatorial by nature is the one that uh, relies on formulas mm-hmm. and repeats jargon. Yeah. Uh, be it on the right or the left, it doesn't matter. What matters mm-hmm. is that you need to have uh, originality. Mm-hmm. And that originality comes out of um, uh, uh, the depth of your experiences, and uh, you need a, an amazing degree of truthfulness and courage to to risk writing that way. Mm-hmm. When you when you were going back to Iran in the nineties. Uh, after in, in the uh, at the end of seventies, in the eighties, in the eighties, I went. Uh, yeah. Uh, did you? Did you, uh, alongside that same topic, were there? Did you find similarities between some of the? I don't know what the word is. Some of the extremism you found in, in Iran with the extremism in, of, of the U.S. Did you find parallels in things you encounter? You struck you. This is very similar to what to what. Um, uh, uh, in terms of your experience? Well, you know, uh, totalitarian mindsets like democratic mindsets, everywhere in the world are the same. Okay. They, they I mean, you what look did, what, at Trump today, yeah. and the first thing I see in him, which reminds me so much of Ayatollah Khamenei, mm-hmm. uh, is not just denial of great fiction, it is denial of reality. Mm-hmm. The fact that they impose their own figments of imagination on, um, on everyone, mm-hmm. not just their enemies, but also their allies. Uh, you know, and um, that was the theme of, I think, reading, uh, one of the themes in reading Lolita, mm-hmm. uh, when I talk about how uh, Humbert imposes his uh, imag- figment of imagination regarding Annabel Lee uh, on Lolita. Mm. Yep. And uh, solipsism is uh, the worst kind of cr- crime because you take away from an individual their right to be who they are mm-hmm. and you impose on them whom you think they should be. Yes. And that is what every totalitarian mindset does, no it, matter where you live. It seems like the artists uh, are always worried about that and predict that, even far back as Hawthorne. Because yeah. I think of Scarlet Letters about that uh, in, in yeah. many respects, even though it's a completely different sen- sen- setting and century. And, 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 and um, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that is the amazing thing that um, you read a work. Um, well, uh, we can go further back than Hawthorne, go to Aeschylus or yeah, that's true. Yeah. Euripides, yeah. and you find that um, uh, they resonate with us mm-hmm. today. Uh, like I always uh, think of Antigone and uh, mm-hmm. her um, dilemma of choosing between her personal conscience and loyalties and mm-hmm. her loyalties to the state. Uh, and um, 
this is something that uh, people are facing today as mm. well. Yes. Well, you're, and you're paying prices you're, for it. Well, you're in ge geographical proximity to a lot of this, right? In terms of your, uh, uh, right? Ge ge geographical hostility. No pro proximity. Oh, proximity. Yes. yes. Um, the geographical proximity to. I'm sorry, I missed what to, you to, said. to a lot of what's happening now, right? Because of uh, 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 well, also because of where you teach. Uh, Right. Well, well, where I teach now, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I don't teach anymore. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So no, you that's taught quite it. All right. I, um, I, I know you taught at Johns Hopkins. I yeah. left uh, Johns Hopkins size uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, in 2017. Okay. I had been there for 20 years. That's a long time. So yeah. I decided I yeah. want to focus more on my writing. Sure, I don't blame you. I mean, I, <laughs> I want to read more. I had such a little time, and yeah. part of that time was spent in Iran. So. Mm -hmm. That's, it's really hard to summarize 20 years' worth of teaching, isn't it? I mean, I want to ask you a little bit about that. Uh, what comes to your consciousness when you think about all those years and your students and the subjects or books you taught, what, what, uh, just anything that comes... Uh, well, you mean in Iran or in... No, in when you were in John, Johns Hopkins. Well, um, of course, in Johns Hopkins, I was also teaching irregularly, but that is one of the most amazing parts of my experiences, teaching. No matter where I taught, um, I, found, uh, I found it exhilarating. Uh, and, you know, uh, at Hopkins, um, one of the setbacks of teaching at, uh, at Johns Hopkins Science was that I didn't get to teach the undergraduates. Oh. My students were all graduate students. Uh, but one of the most interesting aspects of it and challenging aspects of it was that uh, these graduate students came from all walks of life and from different countries okay. and backgrounds. Uh, and um, a lot of them didn't have much background in literature, and yet they were reading, um, in my class, uh, uh, Bulgakov and uh, uh, Penin and, <laughs> wow. you know, um, uh, Fitzgerald. Um, mm -hmm. I even taught uh, Bashir Hammett's Maltese Falcon. Yeah. Um, so uh, at first I was worried that they don't have all of them English background, background in English, in, in literature, mm -hmm. and how are they going to respond? Mm -hmm. And the response was amazing. Wow. They, they got so involved in these books, uh, both in Iran and in America. I'm in the habit of giving students journals okay. uh, so that in their journals, they can say anything they want to about the works which they read without any um, restrictions or uh, feeling that they have to perform as they do sometimes in class. And uh, I had some of the best responses. Wow. And of you course know, you would read the responses, right? Because they're, they are, um, they're, I guess they're turning in the, these, these responses or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they would turn in the responses yeah. and I would respond to them. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, I always felt that apart from um, the usual papers and class participation and all that. Um, I would have li I liked to create a small, intimate space between me and every student, uh, so we would both be free to just express our opinion. Uh, some of them didn't like the books, oh, yeah. and they would they would mention it. But mm -hmm. the point about it was yeah. that I realized the power of literature, that it is not something that you just learn um, in a class and, and that's it, mm. that it connects to you uh, first through your feelings. First, it's like reading a poem. Mm. Um, at first, you only react to it through your emotions and feelings. Then you go and analyze it and think about it. And, um, but, but that first spark has to be there. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I enjoyed teaching. Uh, before that, in Iran, I was teaching mainly students who had background in literature. Mm. 
so this was my first experience with people who didn't. So it was, it was I guess it was a survey course of diff- different majors, right? Diff- students with different, um, different it was, majors. It was a course um, about um, uh, politics and fiction. Oh, wow. Uh, I wanted to, because you see, one of the problems I discovered uh, and, and uh, through not just through teaching, but through traveling and uh, giving lectures at different universities and even high schools, uh, I discovered that sometimes for the young generation, the question is, why do we need to read these books? Mm. Or as one student told me once, um, uh, he said he's read uh, Fitzgerald in high school. Why should he read it again? Is he talking about so Great Gatsby? I, they're talking about the one not wanting to read Great Gatsby again? Is that what they're... Yeah. <laughs> what they're yeah. yeah. I mean, I've read Great Gatsby I don't know how many times. Yeah. And, Great, and Great what Gatsby, I wanted yeah. them to understand was ways through which literature, when you read it as literature and not as a moral or political uh, tract, mm-hmm. uh, literature opened amazing doors to reality to you yeah. that you had never known. Yeah. And so I wanted to show the differences between literature and politics, mm-hmm. um, and and even in use of the words, uh, in the style and form, mm-hmm. uh, uh, how um, impregnated the words were with literature and how empty they became when applied to certain political um, uh, jargon. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I wanted to show them how literature changes their perception of reality. Wow. And, and through changing the perception of reality um, gives them a lot of power uh, in deciding their own fate. Mm. You know, and, uh, and so um, that was why I wanted this to be about literature and politics. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, they wouldn't think so utilitarian way. Right. Uh, well, utilitarianism is kind of taking over, it feels to me today. Yes. I mean, I've never, yes, seen, yes. I've never seen anything like it in, say, 50 years, that the uh, oppressiveness of that... Of that um, do you agree, would you agree with that? With that? Uh, yeah, I, uh, utilitarianism uh, is uh, that was again one of the things I wanted um, to uh, talk about in uh, Republic of Imagination. Uh, that is uh, the worst kind of um, uh, worldview, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 it is not pragmatic. It is utilitarian. Yeah, it's different. Uh, yeah. And and you know, I felt that at our universities nowadays. There are two kinds of um, worldviews that are both dangerous to our students. Mm-hmm. One is the corporate worldview, mm-hmm. uh, where everything is so classly um, uh, categorized, uh, mm-hmm. and and uh, at the heart of it is uh, um, exactly opposite what Havel was saying. Uh, you do everything because of the goal, mm-hmm. uh, because of success. And, uh, in, and success in its crassest manner. Mm-hmm. Um, and then ide- ideology, where mm-hmm. you uh, formulate everyone and everything according to uh, a specific ideology, and then you don't have to think about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and this is happening. Uh, I mean, we keep talking about the divisions between the left and the right, mm. uh, but when you don't have thought, when you don't have imagination, uh, then you have ideology. That's right. And ideology is always polarizing. Mm. That's interesting. It makes me think a lot. I wanted to get your impressions of a particular part of Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. Uh huh. Because I know that you really know James well. And I'm curious, this, this famous conversation between Madame Merle and Isabel Archer, right? Uh, yeah. where they talk about, I guess that's a debate that never ends because it's timely now about appearances and authenticity and my dress doesn't matter because it's just artificial. And then somebody, then Madame Merle says appearances are important. And, you know, that, that what, what, what do you, what's your impression of what James is uh, yeah, uh, getting that at is there? The, the amazing thing uh, where um, you find the kinship between Jane and, uh, between James and Austin, Mm-hmm. Uh, about um, the whole 
um, debate around appearances and reality. Uh, what is the truth and what we want to um, to invent as truth. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I I think that that whole idea um, about having to um, uh, define yourself and um, sculpt yourself mm-hmm. according to a whole set of outside rules um, makes it also makes life it makes life dull and meaningless mm-hmm. but at the same time it makes life easy and comfortable uh, because you, you don't want to be bothered by ambiguities mm-hmm. you want to appear as those rules uh, say you should appear even mm-hmm. uh, of course in James that is why gestures become so important yes. even the way you use your hands oh, yeah. uh, becomes uh, uh, important yeah. and uh, and uh, the heroines the protagonists uh, like right now I'm thinking of um, Catherine Sloper and someone as different from Catherine as uh, day and night, namely Daisy Miller. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> both of them uh, um, decide to break the rules. Yep. Each of them, in their own way, are revolutionary. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're, they're both uh, radicals. They're both yeah. both women. In a sense, you know. Yeah, I mean, they are amazing. I, there is this um, um, sentence uh, uh, from um, ambassadors. Yeah. Maria Gastri tells uh, uh, Lambert Strether uh, that you're a perfectly equipped failure. Huh. And I wow. love that uh, phrase wow. because I think perfectly equipped failures are those who, in the eyes of the ones who want only to live through appearances, um, they fail, Mm -hmm. you know, and there is such success in their failure, Mm. Uh, you know, and that is what James's um, protagonists mainly are. They're perfectly equipped failures. Hmm. I'm wondering, you're working on a book now or you have one forthcoming, right? Yeah, I'm working on a book now. It's very difficult, I'm discovering, Mm. uh, to write. Uh, I mean, during a pandemic, you think that you have a lot of time Mm. uh, to to do this, Mm. but um, uh, focus becomes rather difficult. Um, um, But I'm writing a book uh, uh, which is very difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing uh, five authors and writing about how um, in our reality today, the way we should define ourselves is not just through our friends and allies, but through our enemies mm. and how we treat our enemies. Oh, wow. And, and how during times of trauma, especially, we invent enemies and um, how to resist this mm. uh, and and because the novel the amazing miraculous thing about the novel is mm. that uh, it doesn't judge it wants to understand oh yeah uh, well not novels I, yeah novels are kind of primarily observational yeah they way. are observational they're, they're and poet, they don't... They're, but they're poetic uh, hold that thought they're poetic in their observation which is the trick of the novel so they're both so in that sense novels are both thoroughly realistic yeah, and yet at the same time thoroughly imaginative, and non it, it all at one at the same time, wouldn't you say? It's kind of remarkable. yeah. That is the that is really the the amazing thing about them. That yeah. as you say, they are both. Yeah. And sometimes we forget so much that we take them as reality, but right. they are not reality. They are completely fiction. And uh, you know, I always used to tell my students that a great novelist is democratic by nature, mm-hmm. because he or she has to go under the skin and give voice to every character, even the villain. Mm-hmm. You have to yep. see the truth and look at it in the eye, and so you have to know the villain. And of course, 
the whole wisdom of this is that even if you're at war, uh, a good, no, a great novelist like a great general knows that hmm. in order to defeat the enemy, you have to know him. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, what, what comes to mind of a really, one of the best drawn villains in literature that you could just think of now with this, this writer is really defending the villain like an actor playing, playing them would? <laughs> what what uh, novels or authors come to mind that really... Went pretty oh far God. with that. I know there's a lot. There's a bit, lot to choose from, right? But, there yeah. is a lot to choose from, and um, the, um, the I, I'll choose something that um, is uh, rather obvious, maybe. Uh, but um, Austen is very crafty in mm -hmm. the way uh, she um, uh, chooses her villains hmm. uh, and treats them because they are not necessarily punished. Hmm. Uh, uh, the negative characters, like as in Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Uh, uh, Lady Catherine de Berg or Mr. Collins don't get what they want. Uh, but the villains in Austin's stories uh, don't get punished. Um, Either. They, um, huh. um, Interesting. Uh, they are allowed a space, but we know them for what they are. Uh, huh. And um, the, the protagonists who are rewarded, uh -huh. they go through grueling self-torture <laughs> yeah. that the villains never do. Interesting. I'm, I yeah. mean, look at both Darcy and Elizabeth. Oh, yeah. Um, they discover terrible things about themselves, mm. that they have been blind, mm. one by pride and one by prejudice, mm -hmm. uh, that they have been wrong mm -hmm. in their judgment. And unless they accept that and go through a period of trying for redemption, mm. um, they don't get to marry. And, of course, the, that marriage is just two words at the end of the novel. The rest of the novel is the process mm -hmm. of education of these two protagonists. Wow. Uh, and, and so Austin is very um, realistic because uh, villains don't always get thrown into jail or die a terrible death or be deprived of all that they have. Um, they have a place. Mm -hmm. And they stay there. Uh, yeah. The most important thing is how we act towards them and towards ourselves. Oh, wow. So when you, when you say that, you mean how, how we understand the characters we're being presented, with whom we're being yeah. presented, how, how, what, what evaluation we're, we're meant to make of them. And by extension, think about our, our daily lives, right? Is that what you're... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Think of, and and, and uh, these great novels always um, uh, turn the question towards us. I always bring the example of um, um, uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland. Hmm. Uh, because Alice, uh, uh, like Alice with Caterpillar, hmm. uh, every, uh, when Alice asks the Caterpillar, who are you? Mm. The caterpillar throws the question back at her, who are you? Mm. And that is the whole point of the relationship between a reader and a text, mm -hmm. that um, the reader questions the characters in the text or wants mm. to know about them, but the characters also question the reader. Ah. Uh, uh, the reader has to know herself mm. in order to survive. Yeah. And um, you, you see this in novel after novel, uh, like in uh, Lolita, mm -hmm. um, Humbert, Humbert addresses the reader over 30-something times as the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. <laughs> wow. You know, you, you, uh, mm. you are the jury. Yeah. You, you should not trust anyone. You yeah. should experience it on your own and then come to decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many, even Trilling, I think, made a mistake about Lolita when they thought that it was just a great love affair. Uh, yeah, boy. It wasn't. I'm, yeah, I mean, that's a very, I mean, that's, um, that's an interesting discussion to itself, uh, Trilling's m miss, missing that. 
that's really something because I know there's. Uh, yeah, know. villains are very uh, seductive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, uh, when we think of uh, Ayatollah yeah. Khomeini yeah. or Stalin or um, Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Villains are um, seductive. They can r- attract a lot of people. Yes, you know? that's that's really profound because I hadn't thought in a long time about Trilling's uh, uh, misreading of that of that book. That was kind of a famous misreading, right in the fifties, right or sixties. Yeah, By I mean, part. calling yeah. it a great love affair. You yeah. know, uh, where well, where was Lolita in this love affair? Yeah, wow. I mean, that's a really, uh, getting back to a more of a practical question now, you, you're saying it's difficult to write now, but what, what, is, what is your actual writing method when you write a book? I mean, what, what is your, do you, anything you want to share with about your, your methods or how, how you, uh, at a well, desk or I, at a, at a, or? I, I went through a lot of um, formal uh, metamorphosis. Uh, in this Buddhist book uh, because I couldn't find um, the exact tone for it. Wow. And uh, and finally I decided that I will write it in the form and I, I, I shouldn't be saying this because I might be changing it again. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, uh, letters to my father. Actually. Oh, wow. Uh, so you're saying that's provisional. I, that's what you have now and you came to that after discarding earlier... Things, yeah, right? because uh, so they they came out every time I wrote the chapters came out as very stiff, huh. and um, and I also felt that I needed an interlocutor, and he was the first person to um, teach me how to think about stories, mm-hmm. and um, after and throughout our lives until I left. Uh, Iran mm-hmm. uh, for United States. He and I had these amazing conversations, mm. and I wanted to tell him that um, now our roles are reversed. Usually, you told me the stories. Now I'm going to tell you the stories. Oh wow! Um, usually, he, you introduced me to authors. Now mm. I want to introduce you to my authors. You know? Wow. Well, we've come full circle because our, our conversation today started with you being read. To, uh, <laughs> and so it's really amazing. You're writing a, a book now, just now as we speak, um, about, that, about that part of your life. But, um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Actually, when I talked about the way he told stories, it was coming out of this book. Mm. That's fantastic. Uh, I... Uh, in every book, it appears in some way or another. Uh-huh. Yeah. As our Nafizi, we could I could listen to you talk all day, but we don't have time, world enough in time for that. For no, that. This was really wonderful. I so enjoyed this amazing conversation. Um, I really I have to say goodbye, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I just want you to know this is a the enjoy, enjoyment was was twofold. Likewise, and uh, I really. Um, I really, again, have to thank you so much for your role and a public role in what you are doing for the arts. It's so important. And um, I really look forward to reading your new book when it's finished, of course. Thank you. And, I um, appreciate it. And, and you're doing a great job for literature and ideas as well. So I try. Well, thank you, Ezra Nafizi. And, and, thank you. And I, make sure we get, get to read your book. <laughs> okay. Thank you. First, I finish it. Um, yeah. I'll talk. I'll listen to you soon. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Bye bye. Thank you.